right, everybody, welcome to episode 25 of the podcast. Now, where we left off, middle school. At this point, I've just wrapped seventh grade, and like I said before, middle school is already that unique time period in life where you're going through a bunch of different transitions. You know, you're transitioning into a teenager, your viewpoints are changing, you start to have your own viewpoints and ideologies that may not always mirror what your parents or close relatives think, and so you're starting to have your own identity, but of course, you still don't know everything yet because you haven't lived enough, so... You have this new level of maturity, but an immaturity that's there, and it's all just stirred together in a blender, so you end up in a lot of chaotic situations. And so it's funny because, like I said, middle school is not that time period most people want to go back and revisit. You know, when you ask somebody, oh, what time period in life would you love to go back and relive? You know, people will say, my wedding day, the day my son was born, maybe even a a great time in high school, my first love in college, when I was 25 and me and my friends took a trip to wherever, all those moments. Middle school, it's not really at the top of the list. And that's because, again, it's just a time period where people are in transition with a lot of things. Look, that's when acne shows up. I used to have some really nice skin as a child. And then, man, seventh, eighth grade hit, my skin was like... Shoot, if we're being honest, most of your adult friends that you met after childhood... You don't even know what they look like as middle schoolers because they never post any of those pictures on social media. It doesn't matter whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat. Nobody ever posted pictures from middle school. That's that area that's just missing. You know, you got baby pictures on there, the toddler years, high school, college, young adulthood. But middle school be missing, missing in action. Can't find no pictures. All right. Unless somebody tags you in one and then you be cussing them out like, take that down. Who told you to put that one up? And so, like I said, middle school for some folks, it just wasn't it. It just was not that time period that people want to go back and and relive because there's all kind of experiences. and, And a lot of times, many of them weren't great. So anyway. It is now the summer after seventh grade, and we are in Pittsburgh, California. So some of the things that have happened since this point in time, I had just finished seventh grade, my father got reunited with his childhood best friend. One of his best friends he has not seen since probably 1974, 75, all right? He had a friend named Otis. Not Otis from The Temptations, because we know this time somebody was actually coming to see Otis. We were, and so, my father was excited and it was kind of a rare sight to see because my father was pretty much a brute very stoic he didn't show a lot of emotion he kind of stayed at the same demeanor all the time unless he had to fuss about something but even if we would go to the movies or something was funny he would laugh but he wasn't gonna do one of the hysterical you gotta fall over to the side because your ribs hurt laugh he'd do like a <laughs> and then that was it like he would never get too excited about anything so sometimes it would be hard to be a kid and i don't know you had like the school play or some kind of production or something and he's in the audience you can tell he's enjoying the show but he just doesn't show it so you you think he's you suck or something because he's just looking at you crazy (laughs) and so yeah he was excited and so i had never seen him like this before and a lot of it just comes from the fact he had a really 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 rough childhood it wasn't even about him having to dodge bullets or nothing but it was just more so He grew up in a household with no money and you have five or six siblings and then other cousins and everybody else living with you. And it's to the point where he has no childhood pictures. He has one picture from when he was maybe 13. That's the only childhood picture I've ever seen of him. I've never seen like his baby picture or pictures of him as an adolescent or a toddler or teenager because they just didn't have money to do pictures. So even my grandma on that side, I have one picture of her that she didn't take until probably the late 80s. And then, yeah, the siblings as well, there's just no pictures of them. That's just the era in which they grew up. And he was somebody who, he had his first job at 12 and then worked for the rest of his life. And so he just had a different experience. So I guess sometimes it was harder for him to, you know, be that whimsical person because it's just how he was brought up. He just had to always have a really tough skin or a thick skin to kind of manage it and deal with whatever comes in with life. So, you know, this was the first time I had seen him in that realm. So I like this side of him. I was like, all right, let's see how this goes. And so we are at Otis's house having us a great time. And Otis even called up all of the additional childhood friends that they had that were still in the area. And they had this big giant reunion at the house, right? So friends had driven in from Antioch or Benicia or Vallejo or Concord or Oakland. Say, oh, you know, all the spots in the Bay. The Bay just got like 100,000 cities. So <laughs> all of these people are there. It's just one big giant reunion. Really, really fun. But what made that trip kind of funny to look back on was the day after the party. 
my father got invited to visit another friend that lived in the area that they grew up with. And so we got invited to their house for dinner. Now they lived further inland. One of the interesting things about the Bay is the Bay has the weirdest weather. Like if you're in Oakland or, or San Francisco in July, it's like 69 degrees. I'm like, what kind of summer is this? But then as soon as you go inland, like 15 miles, the, the temperature changes by like 25 degrees. It'd be like 102 degrees. I'm like, what the heck? So the friend, I can't remember what part of the area they lived in, but it was somewhere further inland. So we're at the friend's house. My mother has already given us this speech before we got off the plane. Listen, when we get there, it is not about y'all. This is your father's trip to see his friends, to see his family. Y'all are not about to mess this up for nobody. Don't go over there acting like you ain't had nothing. Y'all not gonna be over there begging. If somebody asks you if you want something, the answer is no, unless we tell you the answer is yes. Don't go over there making no complaints, no suggestions, no nothing. Don't even ask about what's gonna play in the car when we play the music, because Michael, I know you're gonna already wanna bring them little CDs of yours and wanna play stuff. No, it ain't about you. So you're gonna be invisible this entire time. Understood? So we've already put in our minds that we're, we're just there to go with the flow. And so we go to these people's house. And of course, you know, when adults are talking, the kids got to go outside or something. So they sent me and Marcus outside in this 100 degree weather. We're so hot. And mind you, we're from Washington State. It don't even get hot like that. Well, maybe in 2021 it does. But normally, 20 years ago, it wasn't hot like that. You know, you might be 75 degrees and that was cool. So we're not used to playing in 100 degree weather unless we're in Savannah. And so... We are outside just, just scorched, burning up. So we finally come inside because the dinner is almost ready, but it's not ready, but they made us come inside, if that makes sense. And so I just remember I was so thirsty, like thirsty. Like, God, just give me water. Just need some water. And so we're in the house and the lady's like, oh, Michael, y'all want something to drink? And automatically I remember my mom's speech. And so right as I'm getting ready to say no, Marcus is like, yes. We're thirsty, it's hot! And I'm like, uh, no, we're fine, we're fine. And Marcus is looking at me like, no, we're, we're thirsty. I'm like, Marcus, shut up. Remember what mom said, just shut up, shut up. And so and the lady's like, are you sure? Mm-hmm, we're fine, mm-hmm, uh-huh. You know, just playing a role. Look, parents be having y'all shook. So we sitting there, and I was annoyed because we were so thirsty. And then it didn't help. They had this dog. It was one of those little ankle biter dogs that runs around and gets on your nerves. And so I was watching the dog just go to his little dog bowl. He's just drinking just luscious amounts of water. Just, you know, it just looks so appealing. That, that dog water ain't never looked so good. I mean, that dog is just all in the water. And mind you, he wasn't even drinking it right. He playing with the water, you know, running up to it and putting his paws in it and splashing and playing in with it. And I'm like, I can't believe it. Got me sitting here thirsty and the dog don't even know how to drink the water right. Anyway, the lady knew we were thirsty because we were in there sweating, all right? Sitting all on the good furniture, just sweating. And so she came and brought us some water and everything. Then my mom gonna look at us like we crazy. Like, now why would y'all sit there and be all dramatic? If you thirsty, say you want something to drink. And I'm like, y you just told us earlier, don't ask for nothing. Mixed signals. Okay, and again, like I said, this is that middle school mind kicking in now. Now I'm starting to get my own opinion. So I'm looking like, what well, you the one who said, don't ask for nothing. So we doing what you said. Now we getting yelled at. What, what do you want us to do? <laughs> Indecisive. So California was cool, but at that same time, my grandmother on my mother's side had also gotten sick. So literally just as we got back to Washington, me, my mother, and my brother got right back on a plane and went to Savannah to go visit my grandma. My father stayed behind mainly because the work schedule wasn't allowing him to take that much vacation because you know how these jobs be doing us. But secondly, we still had Cisco, our dog. And at the time, while we were in California, my parents had paid Chris. Chris is the kid from the previous episodes, my good friend who had the sister Valerie. You know, they had paid Chris to go to the house and to walk Cisco. And there was a pond not too far from our house. So Chris would take Cisco to the pond and feed him and have all the human interaction and everything. Thing. And so, you know, Cisco had a good time because Cisco is an outdoor dog and he was a Border Collie lab mix. He just wants to run and we already had a big yard. So Cisco was good, but my dad just wanted to make sure Cisco was also fine. So anyway, the three of us have gone to Savannah. And so my grandma gets sick for the first time. If you follow the podcast, I talk about in the very, very first episode that she got sick when I got out of college as well. And so this is 10 years earlier. So she had been sick. And so all of my mother's sisters are in town now. My mother and her sisters do not get along, and it's the most entertaining thing because they all act alike, but they just can't see it in each other. So it is hard to get all four of them in a room together and for there to be peace. However, in this moment, they decided, let's just get along for mama's sake, which was really great because finally everybody could be in the same room and there wasn't gonna be any drama. Like all of the sisters have another sister that they click with, but then sometimes they stop clicking with that sister and go to the other sister and then this sister's talking about that sister with what this sister did. And really we need to just go on a yonla, the whole family, just do family therapy. However, I don't know about Ayanla because I don't wanna be on TV, but second, Ayanla be having people do crazy stuff. You know, she put your hand in that hornet's nest. 
Put your hand in the hornet's nest. Each sting represents the words that you said that were hurtful to someone else. You are in pain and have shortness of breath because you have shortness of patience. That's how you treat your family. You're not patient, and so you feel the pain. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched the show she has, but she always has them people doing all kind of crazy stuff. They got to lay down and talk to the grass, and they got to put the face into the dirt, and then they got to lay down inside a pile of leaves. And I'm like, all right, she'd be having them do all kind of crazy stuff. But yeah, the family, we, at some point in time, we need to all just go and sit in the therapist's office because clearly they got stuff they need to work out. So while we were there, we would go to the hospital and visit my grandma, and everybody would hang out and have a good time. But my oldest aunt was somebody who did not believe in just sitting around all day. She has got to go and do different things. If she comes to town, she we're, we're going to go visit something. We're going to sightsee. This is the same aunt from the very first episode, and, and the same aunt that came to visit on the last episode that helped paint the house. Like she is just she cannot sit still. We got to go and do something. She does not believe in just sitting around. And so she decided we were going to go and see the city, which is something we always do. Every time she comes, I know. We're gonna go to River Street and she's gonna take us downtown. And so she brought her own rental car because the other thing is she will not touch my grandmother's car. So my grandma had this Corvette from the early, early 1980s. I don't remember what year, but it was a car that she just drove. No maintenance, no check-ins, no taking it to get the oil changed, the tires rotated, none of that stuff. She literally just drove the car and put gas in it. And so the car didn't have air conditioning, the heat didn't work, there was no music, and what would make it so funny, again, Savannah, Georgia in the summer is so hot, plus the humidity, and so she would still put that little reflective thing in the in the windshield that was supposed to block out the sun, you know, it looks like a big giant piece of foil, we used to be like, Grandma, it's still hot in here, it's still hot, Grandma, can we put the windows down, and this was a two-door car, so when you were in the back, you know, you, you didn't even have a window that you could let down, you just had to sit there, and she didn't like the air blowing on her from outside. She'd be just fine driving in this hot car. We'd be going through it. And then she'd also have the nerve to put the club on the steering wheel. You know that thing they put on the steering wheel so you can't steal the car? And we used to be like, Grandma, really? I, I promise you, you don't have to worry about anybody still in this car. And she also had a bunch of chemicals that were always in the back seat. Just all kinds of aerosol sprays and cans that would be rolling. And every time she'd hit the brakes, they would roll under the seat and roll back. And so it's all kind of kerosene for the grill and bug spray and 409 and bleach and WD-40, all kind of stuff. Like, if we ever were to get in a car accident, the whole car was just going to blow up. Because, I mean, it was just a moving fire hazard. It was just a moving bomb. And so I remember when we were kids, especially in the summer when we had to go to church you know we had to dress up for church so we'd be in like suits it's 110 degrees outside and we'd be in the back of my grandma's car burning up on the way to church dying <laughs> like but anyway so kim would never drive that car so kim was in town and kim again is that's my oldest aunt and so aunt kim is the rich bougie wealthy diane carroll from different world when she was whitley's mom that's my Aunt Kim, okay? Big time lawyer, been in practicing for 30 plus years. Some of the biggest names in corporate law she knows or she's been on some really big cases. And so she is the one that has traveled the world and been into many different spaces. So she just can't sit still. She does not believe in just sitting in the house all day. So she would always gather up all the cousins and we'd go into town. And it would be so funny because me, Brandon and Marcus would fight over who was not sitting in the front because none of us wanted to sit in the front we'd always want to sit in the back because she couldn't drive like really great person but we'd be terrified in the car with her because she just literally think of the mayor's wife on the color purple that's how she would drive just she would just do anything and so as soon as we get in the car we'd be like oh my god you you'd just be in there praying the whole time i'd be looking at the floor i didn't even want to look at the road because she'd just merge and switch from lane to lane and do this and take a left turn here and a right turn there and she'd always forget when you're taking a right turn to look for people in the crosswalk so there were a few moments where she almost took somebody out taking a right turn and so she'd just be driving clueless to the fact that we're all terrified because she doesn't think she's a bad driver. So every time we'd get in the car with her, especially if we were going somewhere in downtown Savannah, she would give us a full history lesson on the whole city. So mind you, we're over here holding on for dear life and she's going like 45 on this tiny residential street that's too narrow for two cars to pass by. And you know, and the slaves, they built these roads, these bricks here that we're going over. They, this is the road that they built. And if you go to this side, and mind you, we're just like, God, let us just get to the destination safely, God. Please, please, please. Like, we used to be terrified in the car with her. And then when we got to a red light, she'd always pull out her little eye drops and put them in her eyes because her eyes would dry out. Because again, you know, being a lawyer and all the reading and looking at the screens for hours and hours and hours, it's some wear and tear on your eyes. And I think at that time she was getting ready to have a surgery soon. So, you know, we're over here like, wait, she can't even see good and she doing all this. And so we'd be so nervous. But 
Anyway, the trip to Georgia was pretty cool. You know, I got to spend some time with my grandma, my favorite aunts, and all of my cousins and everything. But of course, you know, we get back to Washington State. And like I said before, every time we would travel and leave the state, I'd always have an attitude when I came back because I didn't want to be there. Like you'd get a taste of what was happening in California or happening in Georgia or other states. And I'm like, dang, man, I don't want to come back here because there was nothing to do in, in Spanaway. So you'd always feel some kind of way. But I did jump into something different this time. All right. I was now on the football team. Don't even ask how it happened, but somehow it happened. <laughs> Long story short, Bobby, who lived next door, if you remember him from the sixth grade episode, Bobby was like, yo, you should come do football with us, you know, because it was like the signups and everything. And I was never a big football person, whether watching it or playing it. You know, I used to watch it on occasion. You know, I used to be a huge Seahawks fan. And at that time, that's still like the era of Ricky Waters um, and Mike Holmgren as the coach. But as far as playing football, that wasn't really much of a sport I played. I did a little basketball, you know, when I was younger. And I was really like the soccer kid. Like in Italy, that's all we played, like soccer and baseball. So football, I was not the best at. And so pretty much I was one of those people on the team that was just on the team to be on the team. <laughs> like I served no purpose on the team. And it didn't help. Even the pads, I was one of the last ones to get all my pads because, of course, it took forever for my mom to take me to get my physical. And so you couldn't get your uniform and stuff until you had all your paperwork in. So finally, by the time I had my physical and had everything ready, the only pads that were left were these pads that were, and I'm talking about the shoulder pads, they were way too big. And so you got this tiny kid that's like 90 pounds, five foot nothing, and I got these big old giant pads that are meant for somebody that's probably about 5'11", 170. So these things were huge. I was walking around looking like a Megazord from Power Rangers or a Transformer, just big giant pads. And then it didn't help because I was one of the smaller ones. We had Coach Sparks and Coach Shelton. And they were trying to tough me up a little bit because I was, a, I was a safety and I was a corner. And I mean, I was all right at it. I wasn't the best of the best. I wasn't terrible. I just was, you know, I was one of those take it or leave it players. But clearly, I wasn't 100% into it. So you can kind of tell I'm not going to be that person to depend on. But they used to do this thing called the bull ring. And this was to kind of make the, the smaller players toughen up a little bit against the bigger ones. Because I'm like, why are you going to put me on corner and safety? I'm the smallest one on the team. But all right. Um, I mean, I guess well, you're going to be a linebacker. So yeah, you better be a corner and safety. But anyway, they used to do the bull ring. And the bull ring was kind of like steal the bacon if you ever played that as a kid. There would be a football in the middle of the field, and the coach would call two numbers. And then the two of them would go and tackle each other, grab the ball, run for the touchdown. And what the coach would always do, he was always going to pair me with the biggest players on the team. There was this kid, Jason Brace, that, God, he had to be like 6'1". 215 pounds and you know he they would always partner me with the biggest people and so every time we played bull ring i'd be like please don't call 43 please don't call 43 because that was my number and then he'd be like 43 i'm like okay please don't call number 2 12 16 18 you know i'm naming all the people that are gonna freaking crack me in half and then of course they would always name the biggest player for me to run against i was like damn ah i used to go through it and so football was entertaining because as we kept going, I actually was trying, but I just needed to weigh a little bit more. I was really a tiny kid and it didn't help. Even after practice, Bobby and Patrick and them, they would want to still practice in Bobby's backyard because, you know, they would come home and you'd have all the pads and everything. And they would still play the bull ring in the backyard till the sun went down all day because, you know, they more so had aspirations to be athletes. I already knew that wasn't anything I ever wanted to do. You know, I was one of those kids. I was into everything but sports. I had even made a solar oven at that point. You know, I had this little science book that my aunt had bought me and it showed you how you could make your own solar oven. You just needed like two really, really big boxes and all these different materials and foil and some other stuff and stuff that was reflective of the sun like I had made a solar oven that summer and baked cookies it took like four and a half hours for them to bake because the oven could only get to like 200 degrees but still I had made a solar oven you know I was into music and building with popsicle sticks and I was that person where I would stand in front of the garage and my parents had that automatic garage door so as soon as the door would start opening I would stand there like it was my concert you know like when the celebrities come on the stage and then you know the staging starts moving or the curtain and everybody's ah, like that was me. So to go and do with the bull ring all day, I was not interested. However, they convinced me to go out there one day. So we're in Bobby's backyard. And mind you, Bobby just lives next door. So we're back here doing a bull ring. And my father happens to come outside. And he comes and he stands and looks over the fence. And he's just so proud. His son is playing football. That's his boy. 
Oh yeah. And so now he's all gassing me up and sicing me up. Yeah, yeah, son. Go on and show him how we do it. Show him how we do it. I want to see a hit. I want to see a big hit. And I'm like, man, mind you, I'm already broke up anyway. I've been getting cracked around all day at practice. And now we're doing some more of this crap in the backyard. I'm ready to go home. I'm hungry. And I'm like, oh, dad, I'm a little tired. No, son, go ahead, show him. You got it. You got it. And Bobby and Patrick and them already know how this is going to end. It ain't been going that well for me all day. And so we go and we set it up. And I don't remember. I think it was this kid, Miles Rodriguez, I think I was going against. And so we go and run for it. And, you know, I give it my all. I just remember waking up next to the fence. <laughs> so I don't even remember how it went down. I just know I ran. And next thing you know, I was looking up at the sky and my head was by the fence. And then, like, Cisco, our dog, Cisco was on the other side of the fence, but I could see him looking at me through the little cracks in the fence, like, are you okay? I was like, you know what? <laughs> I don't know how this season is going to go, but honestly, football, it actually was fun. I had a good time doing it. We were undefeated that season, um, but the only thing that sucked, it was, it was like eighth grade, so it wasn't even like one of the big, big years. It was really like, once you get to ninth grade, that's when the stuff would count. And I played again in ninth grade. I'll talk about that in a different episode. But, you know, the funniest bit with all of football was, those big giant pads I had like my dad was so annoyed when I came home with the team pictures you know you take the big group picture and the solo picture and my pads were so huge like the shoulder ones that like I had to do this pose where I was like on one knee and one hand is holding the ball but my shoulder pads are so big they're like one is angling up to the sky my dad was like why would you take a picture looking stupid like that with them big old pads on and I'm like well geez dad if you would have took me to get my physical on time I would have been able to get the pads that actually fit now my dad got an attitude. I don't know who you think you're yelling at. And then here I go, oh my God. Okay, you you but you got one more oh my God left before you meet him. And so I was just getting fussed at. And it didn't help, even with football. You know, for every tackle or touchdown or sack or anything that you have or interception that you got, you would get all these cool stickers and stuff on your helmet. And I, uh, I think I might have had one sticker the whole season. And then you also got accolades if your uniform was really tore up and, you know, worn down from all the big hits that you were getting and all the power plays. And, man, my uniform was so nice and clean. So I used to go and get my helmet. I used to hit my helmet against a brick wall just to put some marks on the helmet just to kind of blend in because, I mean, that helmet was so polished and shiny. I was really just modeling the uniform, to be honest. Overall, 8th grade was pretty fun. 8th grade was the year I really started finding my new friend circle. I was still kind of running with Bobby and them, but I had kind of found new friends and everything. There was this kid, Chase, that I was super tight with. And then, of course, I really liked hanging out with the 9th graders because they were the most, just the most ratchet group of folks ever. But they, it was so much fun. And so I made all these new friends. There was this kid, Antoine. Me and Antoine were like super tight. <laughs> like, the two of us together was the life of the party. You gonna get both of us just frying up everything and everybody. Like, anytime the two of us were in a group setting, everybody was just laughing that whole time because it was just a mess. And so, I was having a really great time. And then, this is also that stage where you're finally paying attention to how you look and everything. And so, it was so funny because at this point, I used to stay rocking like this kind of high top fade with S curl. And I remember I used to do the S curl myself. But one time I wasn't paying attention. I had the wrong box. <laughs> and so I ended up perming the top of my head. And so like the top of my head was like super flat. And my mom was like, what the? What did you do to your head? I'm like, I tried to use the S curl box. She's like, Michael, that's my perm you to put in your head. I'm like, oh, my bad. And so <laughs> I had like two weeks where I had some like silky smooth strands <laughs> for like two weeks. And then. I remember I used to go to King's Barbershop. It was this barbershop right outside of Fort Lewis in, in Tillicum. And all of the barbers were like these Vietnamese and Korean women. And this lady, Anna, used to do my hair. Because, you know, I told you, my daddy was cheap. He was not going further into the city to go to the barbershop that cost more. So we went to the $7 Koreans to get our haircuts. And one day, you know, I was the same hairstyle, a regular high top fade. And I could put my little S curl in it. Anna wasn't there that day. And everybody knew if Anna wasn't there, don't go to nobody else because the rest of them are going to mess up your head. My dad wasn't having it. He done already drove out there. You, you gonna get in one of these chairs. And so I got in one of them chairs. We hadn't even been in the chair for three minutes. That lady said, uh-oh, uh-oh. I said, uh-oh, what you mean? Uh-oh. What happened was I told her it was supposed to be faded on the side. She just was so pressed to cut because she kept saying, skin, skin, skin. I was like, what do you mean skin? No, I just want you to fade, skin. And so she took the clippers and went straight to the side and just zoop. And so she cut too far into the side where it was like cutting into the top of my head so like the right side was now like parts were missing and so it wasn't even and you couldn't fade it because she had pretty much skinned it all to the side so I'm looking like you know the right side there, there's no fade it's just all like cut super close and then there's my hair sitting there but she cut a little too far anyway so my hair is like 
like a half a centimeter over at the top is like there's nothing there so it's like it looks like you were cutting my head bald and just stopped halfway and so then she tried to still fade the other side and I'm like well you didn't mess up one side you might as well just do it to the other side and so now I'm looking like I done got recruited for the military you know I didn't picked up my Camaro I just finished basic training I was so pissed then I had to still go to school and it didn't help Antoine was in my Washington State history class and man as soon as I walked in the door he just gonna bust out laughing like hysterically for like five minutes <laughs> I was so mad and then everybody else in the class starts laughing too I was like man <laughs> I hate it here <laughs> And you know, when you get a jacked up haircut, it's gonna be jacked up for them two weeks. You, you gotta wait for your hair to grow back. I, I was hot, pissed. But we all used to cut up at school, and one of the things everybody used to do, belt wars. That used to be so much fun. That's when you pretty much just take off your belt and y'all all start hitting each other and chasing each other around the halls. And so it would be like eighth graders versus ninth graders, and I mean, we'd be in that school cutting up. And remember, we had one-way hallways at this middle school. Like, my middle school is like this big, giant rectangle, and you had to walk in one direction upstairs when you're going to the floor. So folks would be <laughs> chasing each other and just lashing each other. And then sometimes the girls would cheat. They would, like, take the belt and use it like a lasso and have the belt buckle at the end. So you didn't want to get hit by them because you end up getting cut or Man, that crap used to hurt, but we used to do belt wars. We did all kind of crazy stuff. That was a really fun year. Um, we got in a lot of trouble, but it was a lot of fun. Speaking of trouble, let me tell you about this fight that didn't even happen that I got in trouble for. So, again, me and Chris are still super tight as well. So, pretty much the people I ran with in eighth grade, you know, there was my childhood friend. It was this girl, Nia, that I was real tight with that we ran together. I was still tight with Bobby and them. I just didn't run with them as much. Chris was one of my best friends, Brian was my best friend, and I ran with Antoine as well. But one time, there was this kid, I'm gonna just call him X. X had said something about Chris's sister Valerie that we didn't like. And so, you know, you're in middle school, you latch onto anything, you, you find any reason to get into some drama. You can't wait to stir up some stuff. So we didn't like what X had said. And mind you, we didn't even hear what was said. It was just told to us, so, you know, at the time, Valerie was like a sister to me. You know, that's that's my best friend's sister. You know, that's like family to me. And, you know, kids in the suburbs, we swear we're so tough. And so, you know, we done told everybody, you know, we about to fight X after school. You know, he been running his mouth. He don't know how to keep people's name out of his mouth, so we gonna handle things. Mind you, I'm not even a fighter like that, but, you know, I'm all siced up now because I, I got Chris with me, so I know we gonna be good. Mind you, Valerie, if she wanted to, could have just beat X up by herself and kept it moving. If you remember the Earthquake podcast, Valerie is that girl that beat that girl up in the cafeteria, all right, had all the staff getting tossed around. Valerie can handle her own. Like I said, that whole family fights, so she didn't even need no help. And so, anyway, me and Kristen sized ourselves up. You know, everybody knows when school gets out, you know, Mike and Chris, they're about to go and they're about to fight X and so on and so forth. And of course, in middle school, rumors spread and everything gets around. Now, mind you, this is before people had cell phones. So folks were either passing notes or talking about it when you were going to the next class. And so by the time you get to the end of the day, everybody knows something is going down. Now, for some reason, Kids in middle and high school swear that as long as the fight happens off campus, you're not gonna get in trouble. But pretty much most schools operate where if the drama takes place or initially has some kind of origin at school, doesn't matter what happens after school or off campus, you can still get suspended. And then even to make it further, even if it has nothing to do with the school, it could have been that you and another kid got in a fight in a totally different state. If you both go to the same school and one of you pose a threat to the other, it's still gonna be some smoke for both y'all. So school's out. We're walking, because of course we walk home from school, and X lives in, I think he lived in Deerfield, and me and Chris lived in Clarewood, but it's all walking distance, and so, you know, we can't even find X. X done cleared out. X, X, X done heard and dipped. And I don't even think he cleared out because of me. He cleared out because Chris's name was attached. If it was just me and X, X would have been like, Where, where's Michael at? Let me go ahead and handle this. But, you know, Chris was there, so it's, it's two of us. What's good? What's good? So, can't nobody find X. X done cleared out of there so fast, and of course, when middle schoolers go and fight, everybody who wants to see it follow so the school knows something is happening there's this big mob following us as we're all leaving and in order to get home from cedar crest you had to go across 192nd street and then there was this whole area where that pond was that i was talking about right now i think it's a neighborhood now i don't remember what it's called but back then there was no neighborhood there it was just like a trail and then the pond and mud and then when you finally get across all that then you're on 196th street and then that would lead you to clarewood or to deerfield or to clarewood 2 or hidden village and all the other neighborhoods and so you know we're walking you can't tell me nothing i, I had this little button down shirt that i got open 
but now and everything Chris had let me borrow this chain he had he had this big old chain with this huge cross on it like this big old cross like the cross was like the size of like a credit card and mind you this was like a metal thing it was supposed to kind of look like it was platinum because this is the era when you know like Birdman and all of them were really really big you know cash money was the thing and you know or even like no limit when everything was platinum platinum it wasn't about gold anymore it was about platinum so this was supposed to be some like platinum cross but it was really just metal but you know so I'm walking I got this big old chain going and we're looking walk in and I'm getting tired now we've been walking for, we've been walking for 20 minutes we can't find this kid <laughs> all right I'm looking like we can go home then but anyway we spot X and he's way off in the distance I'm like oh there we go let's go and so we all start running to go after him and I don't even think he realizes that we're coming and then everybody else behind us is following and so on and so forth mind you we've been looking for this kid for like 20 minutes and so we're running just as I'm running I see this car that looks real familiar it's my mom and I'm like what is she doing home she, wait a minute, she don't even get off till five. And I'm looking, I was like, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot. And so my mom pulls up, Michael, why is this I hear you about to fight somebody? And I'm standing there, what? Cause I am dumbfounded, like how do you know? And she, what, you about to get your butt in the car, get in the car, like, hey Chris, you go home before I talk to your mama. And so I'm like, what the heck? So there was this girl, Ashley, that we went to school with who heard about what was happening. She went and already told the office that Michael and Chris were going to go fight her friend X. And so the school called my mother and gave her a heads up about what was happening. So they must have called her before school was even out. Like the school already knew what was up. I'm like, are you serious? So my mom, I was so embarrassed. Like the way I got fussed at in front of everybody. Like she was still in her work clothes going off, get in the car, get in the car. The rest of y'all take your behinds home. And so we go in the car and go back up to the school. The whole car ride, I'm over there like, man, I don't want to go to school tomorrow because everybody just saw me get fried up by my mother in front of everybody. Because mind you, my mom went off before I got in the car. You gonna sit there and act like all of a sudden you fight. Boy, you got usher practice and I get in the car. And so I'm sitting here annoyed. We get to the school. Miss Barnett, that's the, the, the principal I told you about from the last episode. The, the one black lady that worked at the school. Awesome person though. But you know, so she brings us in the office and, and it's the most awkward experience because Normally, you know, the schools take these kind of things very seriously and you know, your son is going to be suspended, blah, 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 blah. Miss Barnett already knows me and so the minute she heard my name, she was like, I know y'all ain't talking about that, Mike. I had to call your mama to make sure I wasn't hearing things. And so her and my mother end up frying me up the whole time. And my mom, girl, I know talk about he going to fight. I had, y'all called me? I was like, are you sure? I know it ain't my son. He don't fight. And so the two of them are literally frying me up while I'm sitting right there. And so my mom gets to go, yeah, girl, because I pull up and he running all these kids behind <laughs> I was like, are y'all serious? And then Miss Barnett gonna join in. Yeah, girl, because had anything happened to that boy, he was gonna be suspended. But the minute I saw it was your son, I knew nothing was gonna happen. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then my mom, of course, has to go and reiterate why I'm such a great child. So she reminds Miss Barnett, yeah, you know, I don't even know what's gotten into him, but you know, he is on the usher board at the church. You know, he babysits the brother. He does all these different things. I don't know why he's sitting there trying to be tough because he keeps asking me if he can join theater. And so I'm like, damn, mom. <laughs> I was so annoyed. And then it didn't help. Now I had like extra eyes on me. Miss Barnett was like, yeah, I'm gonna really keep my eye on you now. So you make sure you stay out of trouble. And then I did not want to go to school the next day. Cause of course, y'all know I got fried up. Everybody was like, yo, remember when Michael's mom came out? Oh my God. And she popped him upside the head while he had to get in the car. Like <laughs> everybody thought that crap was so funny. I was annoyed, but man, my mom had a field day with me when I got home. And where'd you get this chain from? I want to sit there and wear a cross and do all the most ungodly things you can think of. I was just like, oh, all right, uh, okay, all right, people, all right. And so, that was a unique time. It was really weird, too, because a lot had happened, like, even, like, when it comes to just, like, tragedy, because, you know, Aaliyah had died that summer before school started, and that was one of the first celebrities I remember passing. And what I mean is, like, a celebrity that I had followed. I was alive for the passing of Tupac and the passing of Easy e and, and Big E and, like, MC Trouble and all of them, but, like, Aaliyah was definitely somebody that you know I was old enough to really understand what had happened and I was old enough to remember when she had come out so it was kind of weird and mind you I heard about it the wrong way my mother is terrible with names and I remember she was reading the newspaper and then she was trying to pronounce the woman's name she just could not get it right oh uh, that girl uh Alina Aliga Aga I'm thinking she tried to say Christina Aguilera yeah to her you know she died in a plane crash I was like, oh no, that's terrible. Not Christina Aguilera. Oh dang, she was just on TRL like yesterday. And so I remember we were at church and then the pastor was doing his sermon and at the end he was saying something about how you just never know where life is gonna go and then out of nowhere he's like, Aaliyah died in a plane crash. I was like, wait, 
Christina and Aaliyah died together. Oh, look. And then, you know, I found out, oh, no, it's not Christina Aguilera. It's just Aaliyah that passed. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. But then, you know, 9-11 had also happened. Like, I remember that morning because, of course, it's the West Coast. So it was like five or six in the morning. And I had just woke up. I'm getting ready for school. And I see that the first tower has been hit. And so I'm like, hey, mom mom because my mom and i would wake up around the same time she woke up a little bit after i did and i'm like hey mom uh you know those two buildings uh, in new york you know, one of them is on fire and she's like oh okay all right and, you know she tossed on back over and then i literally remember watching the second one hit you know while they were live when they were talking about the first one because i remember when the first one got hit i kept thinking like man it's gonna take them forever to fix that and then literally while i'm thinking that you see the second plane hit the other one i was like oh shoot what the heck mom mom Hey, mom, th th another plane hit a different one. And then she got up high and walked in my room. We was looking at it. And it was like watching a movie because you'd never really seen anything like this on live TV before. And then they do the breaking news that the Pentagon has been hit. And now they're evacuating the White House and the U.S. Capitol. And there's another plane that's not accounted for. And they don't know where it's going. I was like, this is kind of crazy. And so I watched for as long as I could. But then I left because I needed to get to school. And so, of course... Everybody at school is kind of talking about it. And then I ran into Bobby because um, Bobby was in, I think, my second period class. And he was, and he was telling me, yeah, you know, the, uh, the two buildings, they crashed down. I was like, they did? Because I'm like, how did they? Wow. Whoa. OK. And so it was interesting because the teachers in the school didn't know how to address it. Some teachers had the news on in the classrooms. Other teachers were not going to talk about it. And then halfway through the day, the principal, this other lady, Miss Davis, because it, it was Miss Davis, the principal, and then Miss Barnett, I think was actually the assistant principal until ninth grade. Um, Miss Davis came in all the classrooms and made all the teachers turn off the TVs and told all the teachers, do not talk about it. Let's just leave it alone. Let them discuss it with their parents. Now, my theater teacher, Mr. Rockoff, was like, the hell with that. And so we had this whole discussion, and he was like, I want you guys to realize you're witnessing the world change before you know it, and things are never going to be the same after this day. And do you realize that possibly tens of thousands of people have literally died in the snap of a finger? And, you know, this is going to definitely open a floodgate of, you know, things in relation to war and terrorism and so on and so on. And, and the thing about it is... I don't think anybody in my age group, none of us were fearful because we lived in Spanaway. Everybody knew, you know, if there was ever going to be a terrorist attack, they certainly weren't going to blow up Spanaway. What are you going to blow up? The Walmart and the pet store? Like, there's nothing over here worth blowing up. So that element of fear almost didn't even exist for us. And because it was so early in the morning, there was almost a disconnect with what happened. You had a lot of empathy and you, you were kind of pissed off at what you just saw. But it felt so far away that it didn't feel like it was home at all, at least for me. Um... And so that was a crazy time, and I remember all these different events that got canceled. This was the same time as the Puyallup Fair. Uh, right now, that's called the Washington State Fair, but I remember Maya, because Maya had just come out with Fear Flying. She was supposed to be performing at the Puyallup Fair that week, and that was canceled. Now, oh, I was hot. <laughs> like, everything was canceled. I, I just remember my mom was still in the military, so she started working late every day for like three or four days. Crazy, crazy time. And then, this is also the same time I got... I don't want to say introduced, but the first time I understood mortality at the age that we were at, there was another kid, out of respect for the family, I won't say the kid's name, but there was a kid I remember, we had a Veterans Day assembly, and it was kind of like an after school event as well, so we did the actual Veterans Day assembly during school, and then for that night, there was another one for the parents to come back to, and so I remember... My mom had come because I was in the little theater group and I forgot, we did some little skit or something, but there was a kid who came and he played the taps and he kept messing up. Like he kept messing up on the taps. Like he kept trying, he kept trying, you know, the crowd was encouraging him and everything like that. And you know, we played the taps and we had the assembly. We had a school dance the next day and everybody had found out that he had killed himself. And it wasn't because of the taps. I, I, you know, I'm not a doctor, I don't know. There were other things happening in life, but I just always remember he was the kid that played the taps uh, and then he died the next day. And so it was a weird day at school because you know, everybody's crying and he was so sad and we're at the dance and nobody can enjoy the dance because people are on this side crying. I didn't know the kid that died at all. Um, and so, you know, it, it was just a wild thing. But let me tell you how trifling teenagers are. So, you know, people are out in the halls hugging, crying, and because it just it killed the mood for the little dance. The DJ played Juvenile back that thing up. As soon as people heard that little cash money taking over, the way people started running back in the gym, like, I was like, wow. All right. Okay, middle school mindsets, you know, attention span of a goldfish. But, yeah, that, that was kind of crazy because you just kept seeing so many things. Even, like, and I remember later down the line, Left Eye from TLC dying. Now, that was the one that, that got me because, again, TLC at the time was one of my favorite, favorite 
acts and they had just done the MTV 20th birthday bash and had just announced that they were going to be getting back together and a new album was coming and, and my childhood friend Nia she was a big TLC fan so me and her could always talk music and stuff like that and so we were all excited and I remember I got up for school and here goes my mom messing up another name Ooh, Michael Jennifer Lopez died Jenna, yeah, Jennifer Lopez, she died in, in Honduras. And so for me, it made sense because I'm like, yeah, Jennifer Puerto Rican, I guess she got some cousins in Honduras or something. All right, because you know, you're still learning how the world works. And so I'm like, all right, oh no, not J Lo. Oh man. And then my mom had gave me a ride to school that day and we had picked up Valerie as well because uh, she just happened to be outside while we, while we were in the car. And Valerie was like, you heard about Left Eye? I said, I heard about what? She's like, Left Eye just died. And I, the way I almost passed out in the car. I was like, wait, are you sure? I heard it was Jennifer Lopez. And she was like, no, you know, it's, it's Left Eye. I ain't heard no Jennifer Lopez. And my mom was like, oh, that's her name. Yeah, I, I got the Lopez's mixed up. Because you know Left Eye is Lisa Left Eye Lopez. Oh, my, yeah, I'm, ooh, wrong one. Yeah, okay, so it's, 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 it's Left Eye. Michael, that's your girl, ain't it? Oh, God, you, you could have killed me. I was done. That, that was the worst day at school. My feelings were so hurt. Oh, I was hurt. <laughs> like, not Left Eye. Oh, because that really was like one of the first musical acts I remember being a huge fan of. Like them, MC Hammer, Bobby Brown, Michael. I ended up liking Janet years down the line. But like when I was little, like four or five years old, TLC was everything. I think I told the story, me and my dad were on a road trip. Somebody broke in the car while we were sleeping at the little hotel and stole all the CDs out the car. Only CD that was left in the car was the Ooh on the TLC Tip album. And so that's what we listened to the whole way back. And so that kind of just brought me right on in with TLC and then they had these colorful videos and stuff so I was hooked so for me there was a nostalgia that existed with them and you know we went to Italy and when I came back to America they had come back with fan mail and that was just my group I was I was hurt and then it sunk in that I would never get to see them in concert and I remembered that my mother did not let me go to the fan mail concert because she said the rapture was coming so I just had rage for two weeks I was like man I, I didn't know what it was like to lose anybody because I never lost any close family members at that point in time and so a lot of times at that age you look up to celebrities and stuff and so that was like the closest thing I had to losing somebody so I didn't know how to take it that it was killing me you know MTV and BET and VH1 they were playing all the videos all day it, it was just sad I was like man what a time and I think when it comes to mortality and, and being that kind of age a lot of times especially when it comes to celebrities and entertainers when you're young, you almost see them as invincible, like nothing can happen to them. And they're these superhumans that just are so talented and you want to be like them. And so when you learn that they pass away or they get sickly or they have cancer or something happens, it just reminds you that life is going to be life, if that makes any sense. And that's for anybody. It doesn't matter what you have or where you come from. Life is going to be life. And so we all get hit by life differently. And so... That was a very interesting time. But getting back to happier things, because this is not even supposed to be a sad podcast. Then when we get to the holiday season, this had to be the funniest Christmas ever. So my grandfather and my step-grandma were coming to town for Christmas. And my Aunt Kim was also going to be coming. And they had never met before. And so my father was not raised with his father. I didn't meet my grandfather until I was eight. And I had only seen him twice up until that point. I, I met him when we first met, because my dad didn't meet his dad until he was in his 40s. So I met them back in like late 95. And then me and my father went down there again in late 96 because he took me to Disneyland. And so I hadn't seen him since 96. At this point, it's like 2001. And so this would be the third time that I ever see them. And then my Aunt Kim, of course, was coming to town. And so, man. You want to talk about different personalities all living under the same roof. Just imagine that. You, you have me, who's kind of just the whimsical, all-over-the-place teenager. You have little Marcus, who's very inquisitive, all over the place, like six or seven years old. You have my mother, who's the church lady and also likes to nag. But also, if her oldest sister comes to town, you kind of watch her energy shift because you can tell she admires the older sister. So the older sister can come to town and boss everybody around. You have my father, who's emotionally removed from everything. Then you have my grandfather father who is very chill very laid back we don't really know him that well and then you have his wife step grandma opal who i love her to death but man she used to nag 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 and so all us under the same roof and so my grandfather and his wife did not want to fly in so they took a train from la the train took 36 hours to come to town because they got stuck in snow like in the cascades and in the mountains in california like by like mount shasta and all that and so the train had run into snow and ice and they kept getting delayed and so by the time they got to washington they were already done already at wits end 
Opal had an attitude the whole time. And, I don't understand why y'all want to live so far. Who even comes all the way up here? This don't make no kind of sense. Y'all could've just came down to L.A. Ain't nobody gonna come all the way out here. Y'all don't even live by nothing. We done been on this train for two and a half days. And now I gotta walk up a hill. Because the driveway was a hill. And then even, like, my parents picked him up from the train station. We used to drive a, um... What was that? They, my dad had a Ford F-150. And so, you know, it's like a bigger truck. And Opal was like, if I fall out of this truck, I'm gonna sue you. Like, Opal just used to, Opal used to just say whatever was on her mind. And I'm like, okay, this is awkward. All right, interesting. So they come and, you know, we give them the room that they're in. And so first night is cool. Then Aunt Kim gets to town. And, and like I said, Aunt Kim is the, the wealthy, bougie aunt that lives in Texas and has the booming law career. And even when she travels and comes to visit family, she's only there for like one or two days and then she gotta go. She, she does not do trips for more than two or three days. She's not gonna be the aunt that spends a week over. Absolutely not. She has stuff to do. And so she gets to the house and it's so interesting because again, these are some very different personalities. So I just remember, Opal kept fussing at my dad to take her to the butcher because she was gonna make some hog head cheese. Now, mind you, one, I don't even like dairy products. I don't like cheese. I might eat pizza on occasion. I'll eat ice cream even though I know my body hates me for it, but I don't do dairy. And so I had never even heard of hog head cheese. I'm like, it, 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 what? Yeah, I make the best hog head cheese in LA. Everybody wants some of my hog head cheese. And so she kept fussing at my dad to take her to the butcher. And it's literally a hog head, like a, the head of a pig. I'm like, oh Lord. And so I remember my dad took them to, to the butcher so she could get all the stuff to make this hog head cheese that nobody asked for. And <laughs> so my Aunt Kim is coming down the stairs, right? And you know, she's talking, oh, and Michael, today we are gonna go to Seattle and we are gonna do this and we are gonna, ah! and like, you just heard the scream. And I'm like, what's the problem? And then we look and there's this big giant head in the sink, you know, like the, the hog head. And I guess in order to make, I don't know how you make this thing, but I guess, I guess stuff has to sit out and all. Kim almost passed out. Oh my God, oh, what is that? What is that? And my grandpa's like, oh, huh, that's awful. She making hog head cheese. <laughs> and so like, Kim, oh, oh, we have got to go. We have got to go. We have got to go right now. So Kim made me and Marcus go with her and we took Cisco for a walk because she was like, I, I can't. Like, she was so grossed out. It was the funniest thing. Like, Kim was like, how long are they gonna be here? Okay, oh, okay. So Aunt Kim loads Marcus and I in the car and we're off. My aunt is like, I'll be back when that thing is not in the sink because I, I just can't do it. I cannot do it. And so remember how I said Kim drives crazy? Yeah. So we're terrified again. This time I'm in the front seat though. And, and mind you, Seattle is like 45, 50 minutes away from Spadaway. And so I'm in the car terrified. Kim is just driving like a lunatic. Just zoom, 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 zoom. And then she'll tailgate and slam on the brakes right before you almost hit the car. And then because she slams on the brakes, the car behind us almost hits us. And like, you're, you're just paranoid. And mind you, she's cussing out all the cars and talking at the same time. And she, you know, Michael, let me tell you one thing. I've been in many, many accidents. And I'm like, that's the last thing I want to hear while we're going instead. 70 miles an hour in this car but you know what i always win the case because you know what i'm the lawyer <laughs> i'm like oh, okay all right and i'm just terrified but we ended up going downtown and yeah we ate it i think we ate at salty's this restaurant that's like right on the water and so i always did enjoy going out with kim because she'd always take you somewhere funny you'd always get to go to like a restaurant you've never been to especially as adults what i i do like today is like anytime she has some fancy gala or something and it's in DC, you know, she'll invite me to be her plus one. Like that's how I got into the White House when Obama was still in office for like one of the Christmas dinners. And the funniest moment I have though, um, I remember she got honored and she had won this big award. Mind you, she always knows everybody. She gets on my nerves sometimes. I remember 2019, I, I went to visit my family in the Bay. And so she happened to send me a picture. It's a picture of her and Viola Davis just sitting together. I'm like, what the heck? She's like, oh, I'm in San Francisco. We're being honored today. And I'm like, oh, I'm in Oakland. So like, Okay, so me and her had linked up, but I'm like, dang, how you just be in all these spaces and you be knowing what I want to do in life, but I ain't going to say too much, but whatever. But anyway, so she was getting honored at this event like a few years back. And so she asked me to be the plus one. Normally she gets like a limo and things to come pick you up, but she wanted me to actually just pick her up and drive her and we go together to this big event. And so I'm like, okay, fine. So I go to pick her up from the hotel and I remember I was driving. I was like, God, please. Don't let anything happen that's gonna make this awkward because she loves to find something to fuss about or you just never know. And so she comes in, everything's all good. Like I pull up to the hotel, she comes out, oh, hello, hello. And you know, the window's down, she gets in the car, slams my door so hard, the mirror pops out of the little mirror socket, the, the um, side mirror. Oh! 
And like, mind you, this happens in front of all of her little rich lawyer friends that are all standing outside with their fur coats and minks and all these little fancy suits and waiting for their drivers and valets to come. Oh my God. And so I'm trying to reach over and I'm trying to pop the mirror back and think, just drive, Michael, just drive, drive. I know people, I know people. And so I'm driving down, um, I forgot what street it is. This is one of these streets over here by downtown DC. And it's like, I have my mirror dangling from the car. And so I had to drive like four blocks away and pull over and pop my mirror back in. She's like, oh my God, Michael, just get another car and I'm like my car is good you just don't need to slam my door so hard she's like oh my god you didn't even wash this thing I'm supposed to be being honored and oh my god look what I'm riding in and I'm like well you can walk <laughs> but um yeah so anyway she, she can be a character but no we, we go to Seattle have this little great time on the water take these nice little pictures and everything and so we finally get back to the house now the other thing that rings true is everybody knows older people love to turn the heat up extremely high in the house like if they could they would set the heat to like die at hell if they could and so the house is so hot because opal kept complaining it's cold it's so cold up here now mind you washington state specifically the region we're in it gets cold but it doesn't get that cold especially in december you know our our low for the day is like 40 you know and then it kind of the temperature sits between like 35 and 45 in December so it's not even that cold and so and we have a very wet cold so you know she's it's so cold and so we had to keep the house I think the thermostat on the heat was on like 83 or 84 it was so hot in the house and mind you Marcus had one of those little betta fish and so he had just got a betta fish a few weeks earlier because it was pretty much a, a gift they gave him after he had this whole traumatic moment with one of his teeth because Marcus just always has something going on he had this loose tooth one time it was like a new loose. You know, like when you're little and you get a loose tooth. And it, it, it takes some days before it gets loose enough to kind of wiggle and pull out. Marcus was so pressed because he knew he was going to get that dollar from the tooth fairy that he forced this tooth out on day one. Like the tooth was not ready to come out. I'm sure he probably messed up a nerve or something, but he sensed that the tooth was loose. And so the whole day he's yanking and pulling it. I'm like, Marcus, just give it to Shut up. I can do what I want to do. It's fine. Go to take my tooth out. I get my dollar. You're just you're jealous. You're just jealous. All right, Marcus, whatever. And so Marcus keeps going. He finally pops his tooth out. And the next thing you know, all I hear is just this loud scream. <laughs> So, you know, I run. I'm like, what's wrong? What's, what's the matter? And, you know, I see all this blood dripping all in the sink. And he's like, I lost the tooth. I lost the tooth. Because the tooth actually fell down the drain. So he's not even crying that he got blood dripping out of his mouth. And he done forced his tooth out that shouldn't have come out. He's pissed because he knows he's not getting that dollar from the tooth fairy. He's like, I did all of this for nothing. For nothing. Because he had been fighting with his tooth the whole day. And I'm like, Marcus, are you? Ah! So he has this whole meltdown. I'm, my mom makes me write a letter and pretend that I'm the tooth fairy and put the letter under his pillow like oh I'm the tooth fairy I always know when the kids lose their tooth and so you will still get your prize or something like that so I think he got like five dollars and um anyway the money that he had for that they went to the pet store and he bought the beta fish because Marcus was always a scammer like one time he came home and he was like six or seven he's gonna come in with this old tooth that he found on the street I lost a tooth and my mom was like wait a minute we need to take you to the dentist if this is your tooth because this was like a brown tooth with the, the hole in the side of it you know like they never went and got a filling my mom was like let open your mouth and we were looking and we're like what tooth did you lose it's in the back and so they look marcus you ain't lost no tooth yeah, i did i did and marcus this is not your tooth what did you find this i found it on the street marcus go go upstairs go <laughs> but anyway so he had this beta fish and i kept telling him like marcus you got to kind of like clean the little bowl out every few days i can help you leave me alone i can do what i want to do stop telling me what to do all right fine stay over there and be stupid then and so he was never cleaning the bowl and so each day the water just got murkier and murkier and his bowl set on this little stand right by the vent. And so we have come from Seattle, me and Marcus and Aunt Kim and Marcus had told my Aunt Kim all about the fish while we were in the car. So she's like, oh, I want to see the fish when we get home. And so we get to the house. OK, so where's the fish and everything? Mind you, again, the house is hot. It's like it muggy in the house. It's hot. It's 80 plus degrees in the house. They're still cooking stuff in the oven. That hog head cheese. I don't know what it's on the counter. I think she didn't made it now. It, it's resting or whatever they got to do to it. Cause Opal then told my dad to invite his friends over to come get some. And so my aunt Kim is like, I'm going to go look at the fish. And so she calls me upstairs. She's like, Michael, I'm like, yes. uh, I guess, I don't see the fish. I'm like, it's in the tank. I, I'm looking, I can't find it. And so I go in the room. That poor fish bowl was so foggy. I was like, Lord. And then we found the fish. He was floating on the side somewhere. I'm like, uh, does Marcus know the fish is dead? I was like, let's just put it down and let him find it on his own. And my Aunt Kim was like, forget that. Uh, Marcus, I think this fish is dead. <laughs> like, poor 
Marcus runs up the stairs. Oh, he has a meltdown about this fish. And mind you, I'm looking like, Marcus, you ain't even cleaned the tank. You ain't fed this thing in about three, four days. But really what we think happened is because it was so hot in the house and so muggy, like the final nail in the coffin for that poor fish was having that fish bowl by the vent with the heat turned up so high. That just finished the, the fish off. Like the water just got clouded with, I guess, maybe oxygen and other stuff. And that fish was done. Like that poor fish. Um, and so we had a whole funeral. You know, we, we buried the fish and flushed it and everything. Marcus was... Oh, Marcus was so hurt. So Kim took him to the pet store to get another fish. But that poor child, he went through it that week. And then I remember, I think it was after church, all of us had gone to Ruby Tuesday. Like, now mind you, Kim didn't go to church with us. She did not believe in sitting in church all day. She goes to her, whatever service she goes to, that's 15 minutes, and then she lives her life. And so she didn't go to church with us, but she was like, I'll meet y'all when it's time to eat. And so we're all at Ruby Tuesday, because that was one of the places we would always go after church. If my parents did not cook the big Sunday meal, it was gonna be Ruby Tuesday, uh, Red Lobster, Sizzler, the Mexican restaurant, one, one of them spots. And so we all end up at Ruby Tuesday. Me, my brother, my parents, my Aunt Kim, my grandfather, Step Grandma Opal. And this had to be the funniest thing because, again, Ruby Tuesday is a little beneath what Kim would want to go to, first of all. You know, this was a little, oh, oh my God, franchise. Oh, franchise. Oh, oh. But she understood it's kind of a family dynamic, so this is where we're all going. And so Opaline, step grandma Opal. She had ordered these wings. <laughs> she ordered these wings, and when the wings came, the wings were too spicy. And then all hell broke loose at this table. And then Opal got the fussing. You know, this is too hot. These wings, I don't know why they would make anything this hot. This don't make no kind of sense. Cole, Cole, Cole. Now, mind you, Cole is my grandfather's name. So he's Cole Michael, and then my dad was Michael Cole, and then I was Michael Calvin. It's all kind of mixed up. My dad was supposed to be Cole Michael, but paperwork got messed up, and so he became Michael Cole. And then my dad was going to try to name me Michael Cole, and my mom said, no, that's enough of these Coles. You're going to put something in the family name that we got. So that's where the Calvin came from. And so, you know, she's fussing, Cole, Cole, I can't eat this. This is too hot. And then he gets it up. Well, you knew it was going to be hot wings. Why are you going to order hot wings? And then you don't get one even because they're hot. And so she said, they're not supposed to be this hot. they hot wings. Oh, but that's what they're supposed to be. And so, mind you, they're so loud they are so loud like so people are like kind of staring at us and mind you my dad is walking back to the table and then me and marcus are already laughing because we had this inside joke about how our dad would always go to the salad bar talking about he's healthy but then he'd come back with this salad that's like 10 feet tall like the salad you know and it ain't just my father folks do this all the time where they go to the restaurants and get the salad bar and then everything that's on that plate is like 2,000 calories. So my dad would have, you know, a little bit of lettuce on there. But that salad would have like 10 pounds of ranch, croutons, ham, seeds. If there was some chicken on the side, they'd get the chicken on there thing. And then the, 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 the eggs that are cut in half and, and the, the nuts and all kind of mushrooms, olives, all the bacon bits. Like th th that salad would be 10 feet tall. And then he was still going to get a meal at the same time. We used to crack up. So my dad's walking back to the table with this 10 pound salad. Kim is just like, what time are we leaving? Like, oh, oh my God, oh, oh my God, I know people, I know people, because Opal and my grandfather going at it, it don't make no sense, this just should not be this hot. Like, I, when I ordered stuff, we ain't at no Sizzler, because they always went to Sizzler every Sunday in LA. There's a Sizzler right by the house over in South Central, so they always go to that one. And so they were like, uh, yeah, because I that's not how that the chicken is where I'm at. You, you ordered hot wings, you didn't order no chicken, you ordered hot wings and so the server came is everything okay yeah no these are too spicy do y'all have bread do y'all have bread and so my grandfather's all annoyed and so they came back with like a loaf of bread but not like restaurant bread because i don't think ruby tuesday even serves rolls or anything they had went somebody that worked there must have felt bad for us and went across the street to the little store and brought back some actual bread from the little corner store like they gave her a regular slice of bread that you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with and so i'm sitting here looking like what's gonna happen with this bread and so i watched her cut all the meat off the bones and turn the thing into a sandwich and i'm like but you're still eating the hot okay i'm gonna shut up and be quiet but um no they showed it behind in that restaurant like my grandfather was so annoyed and my mom thought it was hilarious because she knew my dad was getting annoyed because my parents always fry each other up uh, they, like they fry up their families like my mom always talks about how my dad's relatives are all half crazy and the first time she went to California to visit them they were showing her how to get down when everybody starts shooting and then my dad's always like you and your sisters are a bunch of little country bumpkin girls that weren't ever allowed to go and do nothing and that's why y'all are crazy and so my mother is enjoying watching this whole exchange with my grandfather and his wife because she's like mm -hmm, what did I say about you and your family 
And then my aunt Kim is just ready to go. Kim is already somebody who, no matter where she goes, she's gonna stand out because she dresses very well. She's very well kept and puts on these very fancy outfits. So, you know, we're at Ruby Tuesday. She's sitting in there with pearls on and lipstick and all this other stuff. And she's annoyed. And then the other part is, Opaline, step grandma Opal. It was so funny because she had this outfit on where it was like the outfit was fine, but she had on these white tube socks and these red heels. And I don't know if that's because she was trying to keep warm because it was cold. And she also used to wear like this purple or like this red kind of like braided wig. And so Kim is already like, uh, oh my, oh my god, oh, 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 <laughs> and everything. And so it was so funny. Like that, I laughed so hard. But you know what? That night we had such a good time because. Um, Opal loves the blues, like she loves Lowell Folson, and so she put on that music, like we would just put on some music, and then it was so funny because like that whole night, the way we were down there just dancing for like hours, that was like one of the best like holiday weekends ever. They even got Kim to come downstairs to dance, because Kim does not dance, and like so they kept playing all this different music, because it went from blues to like, you know, 70s funk and like Earth, Wind & Fire and everything, and then they put on the Michael Jackson, Michael, do the Michael Jackson thing, show them the Michael Jackson thing, I don't want to shut up and show the Michael Jackson thing, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I'm doing a little Michael Jackson, Billie Jean routine, and Marcus is doing his, like, it was so much fun. It was a really, really great time. Um, now, as far as that hardhead cheese, what ended up happening, uh, my dad's friend Jim came by and was like, this thing is nasty. And, and so we were trying to figure out how to get rid of it without offending anybody. So I think we had cut it all up and put it in, like, Ziploc bags and everything. And then as, as soon as they left, the way that went to the dump, it's like, oh, y'all ain't eat the ladies' hardhead cheese? I didn't try it because I already knew I, I can't do it. I'm good. But no, it, it was a lot of fun when they were there. They were a lot of, <laughs> they were fun to laugh at, but like they're, they're a very loving couple. It's, it, it's one of those couples that are just, you know, they've been together forever. And so they, they, they need each other to thrive. And it was so funny because they were talking about how, you know, when they get back to LA, they do the couples therapy at their church. You know, they're going to do the, because uh, they're the, they're the lovebirds or something, that, whatever the name of the group is. And my mom was like, the way they done cussed each other out the whole time they was here, how they going to be leading the marriage counseling? I was like, listen, they still together. <laughs> but, ah, oh, good times. And the thing I love is that I grew closer to my grandfather and Opal as time progressed because, again, I didn't really know them that well at that time. You know, as a kid, I only saw them about three or four times. And so as I got older, I started making an effort to build a relationship. And so, you know, I talked to my grandfather and his wife every Sunday, every Sunday. You know, COVID is kind of slowing things down, so I'm not able to travel. But every time I'd go to L.A., I'd always go and visit them. Um, the last time I went to L.A., I surprised them. I didn't even tell them I was coming. I just showed up. And so I always try to make an effort because, you know, those are my only living grandparents at this point. Um, but it's so funny because when I go down there, Opal still doesn't know my mom's name. My mom's name is Karen, but she's been calling my mom Carol this whole time. How's Carol? How's Carol doing? Yeah, you tell Carol to call me, all right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. But anyway, getting back to school, one of the things that was really funny that I always remember as well, the eighth grade talent show. And so, <laughs> again, we've had a few episodes where I talk about all these different projects I had jumped into. And so I'll say at the age that I was in eighth grade, I had all this talent, but I didn't understand how to put things into perspective and, and utilize them the right way or really hone my talents and, and structure things. I knew I could dance, but I wasn't at a place where I could put together shows and stuff yet. And so I remember we decided, oh, we're going to do the talent show. So me, my friend Antoine, it, first of all, we had this huge group at first. It was going to be this big dance group. So it was me, it was Antoine, it was this guy Roland, and it was this kid, this kid Marcus Reed. It was us four boys, plus this girl, um, Alicia, Chandrell, Doris, and, and my friend Nia. And so it was like eight of us and we were going to just have this big elaborate routine in my head I was like oh yeah because for me the talent show was always like the Grammys or, or the VMAs or something it, it was a big deal like this is this is our show and so you know I had already went home I had mixed the music on my little cassette because this is when you still mix music on the tape player where you know you have the music play in, in the stereo from the CD and you record what you hear and then you get the piece you want and you have a double tape and mix. like I had already made a mix in the mix it had it opened with the, the beginning of like Rhythm Nation and then it went to Fabulous, Holla Back, and then, uh, God, I can't remember half of these songs. I want to say it did Aaliyah's More Than a Woman Breakdown, because, yeah, that was still a big song, you know, especially after she had just passed. Um, you know, she was really popular. Totals, What About Us, Q Tips, Vibrant Thing, um, and then Michael Jackson's why you wanna trip on me? And then oddly enough, you can tell I made this playlist. We closed with Parliament and the Funkadelics flashlight. That was the mix. And so what made it so funny is 
we never rehearsed. We we would never rehearse. I think we had two or three rehearsals. So we had rehearsal number one, which was after school in the hallway for like 10 minutes. And then the teachers were like, if you don't have an advisor, you can't be in here. And so we all left it and went home and went wherever. And so after day one, Nia left the group, Alicia left the group. And so now it was down to me, Antoine, Marcus, Roland, Shandro, and Doris. And so... The second time we had a rehearsal, uh, I think we did it at Marcus's house. But again, hormonal teenagers in a space where there's no adults. It was no rehearsal. It was just us hanging out, partying and dancing. And it, ain't nobody did no kind of rehearsal. And so mind you, the talent show was in like two weeks. We even went to Walmart and got the outfits because our group name was going to be No Boundaries. And what No Boundaries was, it was just the brand of the shirt that we saw at the store because the girls bought these little red t-shirts and we were so cheap, we were going to you know return the shirts afterwards. So we never cut the tags. And so the tags on the shirt said No Boundaries. So the girls had these red shirts and then the guys, we got these big white... Um, like white beaters and these white visors. And you couldn't tell me nothing about my visor because you know I had the visor with the little faded S curl at the top feeling myself. And so the last rehearsal we had, I think was at my house, <laughs> right? And it was kind of a rehearsal, but not really. No, 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 we did another one at Antoine's house. That was the last one. And so I'll say we went to the sh talent show with an idea. We all knew what we thought we were gonna do. As far as actually executing it, all over the place and so the talent show they made you do the initial tryouts or the, or the rehearsal we did the rehearsal tryout it was a hot mess we don't even know what we were up there doing just up there doing anything and then then marcus got in trouble so marcus couldn't be in the group so now we were down to like it was me antoine roland chandrell and doris all right it, it, we getting smaller and smaller it's down to five now and so i just remember there was like this huge bit of competition all around the school because there were a lot of talented kids we went to school with. One thing I will say, a lot of kids in Washington State are very talented. I don't know if it's because maybe sometimes depending on where you live, there's not a lot to do, but there's lots of really, really talented kids that sing, dance, tap, play all kind of instruments, just do all kind of crazy things. Like my friend Nia I was telling you about, like she did music production. She could produce her own music and everything like that. Mind you, she was like 13 doing it. And so, you know, there's all these talented kids that are, you know, doing all these other things and there was this kid Jimmy Jimmy was kind of like it's cool because we're all adults and we're all good now but at the time he was kind of like the, the arch nemesis because we all could do the same thing like Antoine and I were real similar because he could sing and dance and, and it was funny and stuff Jimmy could do the same thing but for some reason we didn't really run with Jimmy in that same manner and Jimmy had his own act that he was doing we didn't know what he was going to be doing but we knew he was going to be performing so somehow me and Antoine had put it in our heads that Jimmy was our biggest competition so let's just make sure we knock it out the park and so it's finally time for the talent show. It's the night of the talent show. And our group has so much hype and suspense around it. We've been over here promoting like, oh, we about to kill it. Y'all make sure y'all come out tonight because the talent show was after school. It was like it's 7 p.m. or something like that. And, you know, we done gassed ourselves up, just sized our group up like this is about to be some epic. Y'all ain't never seen nothing like this before. And so, you know, we have a huge entourage in the audience. You know, my parents are in the crowd. All of our friends and stuff are in the crowd and everything like that. And so, you know, all of these kids they go and perform it and it was a good mix of everything you know it was like this white girl singing some faith heaven song or something like that there was another girl i remember britney spears was big so this girl had went and sang britney spears overprotected but she didn't actually sing she went to lip sync just like britney and just kind of danced around and so i was like okay so listen she pioneered lip sync battle we didn't even know it was a thing yet give that girl her credit and give her a check wherever she's at because that little girl <laughs> went and did the whole britney song and so we ended up being the first group that like actually went out of all of our peer groups and so we're hype and everything you know killing it you know my mom is out there with the video camera recording and everything and <laughs> we get out there we start off okay you know the little pieces that we did remember that we rehearsed cool you know it got through that little rhythm nation bit got to the little fabulous um holla back after holla back <laughs> it, it was a disaster because i remember Q-Tip's Vibrant Thing was the next song. None of us remember what the steps were, so we were all up there just doing any and everything. And the crowd starts getting quieter, because you know when we first started, everybody's, yeah, woo, yeah, y'all better kill, y'all better do that, yeah. Man, a minute and a half into our dance routine, it was dead silent, because it was just that bad. Like, it was horrible. Like, Chandrell and Doris had worked on this piece for the Aaliyah more than a woman bit where it was just them two doing like this little routine but Doris had forgot all the choreography so Shangel or Shangel's rolling her eyes at Doris and mind you our clothes still got the tags on them and we didn't think to tuck the tags in so the tags are hanging out on the back of our shirt so everybody sees Doris and Shangel with these big red shirts on and these big yellow 
square tags that are on the back every time they turn or do something. And so they messed up their segment and then the boys would come out right after and we had a chair routine to total what about us and we messed it all up. I think Roland kicked the chair too far and it came off the stage so he couldn't finish his part of the routine. And then it was so bad. It was so bad. And then at the end we had flashlight come on or something like that. Oh, I, I had a quick solo piece to Michael's why you want to triple me part, but it, it nothing was salvageable. It was, it was a hot mess. And so we realized that we sucked and that we were absolutely terrible and that we should have actually rehearsed and practiced because then the next few acts that came after us were all so good there was this girl Lacey and she this sounds so cheesy but Lacey was cool Lacey was this black girl and she had performed vanilla ice 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 baby don't ask any questions just know that it fit perfectly with Lacey's personality and there were these two twins Ashley and Nia that were her backup dancers and mind you and not not the Nia that was in our group but another Nia and mind you they were identical twins so you know they had the choreography together and mind you they're twins so it looks even cooler Lacey's thing was so lit for this to be such a corny song it was so good and then right after Oh, it was time for Jimmy to go on stage. And like I said, me and I'm already a hater. Antoine's hating. We just trying to find something wrong. And we're already pissed that we weren't even good. Jimmy ends up singing Usher, You Don't Have to Call. Jimmy can actually sing. So that also makes it like bonus points. But before he even got to the song, he had Valerie and this girl Jessica Bloodsaw. Like they were his backup dancers. And so when they started, he opened with the dance routine to like Janet Jackson's You Ain't Right. And I mean, they like killed it, killed it. It was like the actual choreography that Janet does on the tour. And so I'm sitting there as they're performing, like my just, I'm like shaking, like, what is he? How dare he? Oh my God. Oh God. Crap, this is good. Damn it. Damn it, this is good. <laughs> and so, you know, they kill that, and then he busts out the Usher song after the dance routine. And mind you, Jimmy was built like an older teenager anyway. So, you know, he had like the, the muscular arms and all this stuff. So he's when he gets to the bridge of the Usher song, he took the coat off and he had a jersey on, and all the girls started screaming because you could see his ah! I was seething, like just livid. Just, I, oh, jealousy, jealousy, jealousy. Because again, I was already insecure with the fact that I looked like I was 12, or you know, I'm, I'm like 90 pounds. So it ain't no woman about to, or no girls were screaming over me at this crap. When I had my little solo doing a little Michael Jackson song in my set, it was like three people clapping. So I'm just like, really? So you know, Jimmy had took the little jacket off. All oh, the girls are screaming. And then right before the bridge is over, they bust out another dance routine. This Negro does Janice doesn't really matter breakdown. And again, Again, Valerie and Jessica are killing it too. I mean, they were in sick. Arms were all clean. I was like, damn, we suck. And so, man, it was so good. But I was a hater. I was so jealous and so envious. I, I couldn't stand it. I talked so much trash the rest of the week. Like, me and Antoine were not having it. Antoine was a little bit more level-headed than I was. I was just unbearable, just insufferable. Just, I was done. Because for me, it was like, I am the one who everybody's supposed to enjoy. Not him. What the hell? And so, I was living. I talked so much trash about Jimmy that whole week. And I think he knew. Like, I kept talking trash. So there was this one day. This is maybe a week and a half after the fact. I'd already told everybody. I don't even think he could sing that good. I don't know why y'all doing all that. So Jimmy already had some smoke for me. And so there was this day where... I'm, I don't even know if Jimmy remembers this. If Jimmy's listening, I'm, he's going to laugh at this. But I remember... I was standing by Mr. Shanley's class. I was waiting, you know, fourth period was about to start. And like I said, our school is a rectangle and you go like one direction. You can only walk in one direction. So Jimmy, I saw him coming towards me and he had walked past or whatever. You know, he and I weren't friends at the time, so we did not acknowledge each other. And so as soon as he passed me, I kind of did like one of those little flinching, mm, like right to him and everything. And I figured since he had already walked past me, he was going to have to just keep going in that direction because you can't walk the other way in the hallway. <laughs> and Jimmy, Jimmy saw my a little flinch move and so Jimmy turned back and looked at me and then I realized he was coming in my direction so I tried to go in the classroom and sit down because <laughs> I'm like oh he won't come in the classroom Jimmy was like why are you talking so much why are you keep talking about me and I'm over here because I have an audience I'm like oh shoot because like all these other kids are watching so I stand up I just said you couldn't sing I don't know what the issue is if you want to box we can box and Jimmy's like okay let's box and then I'm like well I can't do it right now because I gotta go to class but if you want to do that we can do it later Okay, I'm going to see you after school then. Oh, God, I was praying to God, like, please forget. Please forget this conversation because I don't want to fight Jimmy. Because if I were to fight Jimmy, I was going to lose. Like, Jimmy was way bigger than me. But I don't even remember how that got settled. Fast forward some years down the line. We ended up being real cool, I think, because he liked Janet. I like Janet, too. That's where we clicked. But he and I just always had, like, smoke for each other for no 
reason. He didn't even have it for me. It was just me being a hater. But um, oh, it's so funny to look back on because like I really thought that after I did my little flinch thing, he would just keep walking because oh, it's a one way hall. The way he turned around, I was like, oh shoot, I didn't plan for this. And then I was like, well, if I run in the classroom, he's not gonna fight me in front of everybody else. Jimmy was ready to throw hands. <laughs> he he wasn't having it with me. Man, so funny. Um, but anyway, so that was that. And then there was the track team. Now track was a lot of fun. Now I did track in seventh grade, but I didn't realize how good I actually was, especially when it came to all the jumps and everything. So like long jump, triple jump, high jump, hurdles. I used to be kind of killing it. So they ended up putting me on varsity at the end of seventh grade. And so in eighth grade, I came in as a varsity player. Now the way our school was set up, because again, we were seventh to ninth grade. Ninth grade is still high school. Everything we did in ninth grade would go on the high school transcript. But we were technically junior high students at, at that age range. So our school was seventh to ninth and we would play other schools that also had a seventh to ninth um, grade setup. And so I was on varsity, meaning, you know, I'm on there with the ninth graders and really I was seventh and eighth grade. And so eighth grade, you know, the only thing I didn't like about being on varsity was I wanted to win too. Like <laughs> I was killing it in seventh grade when they had me on just like the JV team. And then I was winning, especially in all the hurdles races. So they bumped me up to varsity. And that was cool until I started losing. Like, you know, when I was on JV, I was winning up everything. It was just a given I was going to win. And so they bumped me up. And now I had to work even harder because now, again, I'm competing against 8th and ninth graders. And that was in 7th grade. So now we fast forward to 8th grade. But I still feel like, oh, uh, God, I still got to work hard. Because honestly, even on 8th grade, you could have stayed on JV. But they had me on varsity. And so, you know, we're over here racing all these kids. And instead of always getting, like, 1st or 2nd, now I'm getting a lot of 4th. A lot of fifth I'm trying to get pissed off and it really it's a it's a lesson learned but it's just understanding that yeah even though you may think you're, you're hot stuff there's always somebody that's gonna be better than you at something else so what else you got but anyway we had to go against this school called Mountain View Mountain View is like these kids that live way out in the middle of nowhere I forgot what town it is it might actually be called Mountain View but these are kids that like chop wood for hobbies all right they ain't got nothing to do but run and exercise and I just saw who we had to race against. And mind you, Antoine was on track with me. We were on the same hurdles group. And so <laughs> I was like, Antoine, I don't want to lose no more, man. I'm just trying to at least get like one third place or something. And so I was like, listen, I'm going to say this. Like, man, if we come out those blocks and they're already like way past me, I'm going to just pretend I'm hurt because I'm tired of losing. Like I was, I was like taking it so serious because I had to learn what it felt like to just lose and be okay with it. Like just recognize there's always going to be another match or something else. Or, you know, if you want to do better, just work harder. And some of it was more of a physical limitation too. Some of these kids were so much better bigger than me because again I was still a short little kid like five feet five feet one and everything and you're racing against some kids that are six feet tall and you know that one leg stride of theirs is like three of mine and so <laughs> we're in these blocks getting ready to race I remember it was like mm, uh, it wasn't raining but it was one of those like overcast guy days man we was on those blocks <laughs> they said ready set you know go and so we jump out of the blocks and we're going and we're racing and I remember we get over like the first one or two hurdles and I'm already getting ready to implement my plan because these little mountain kids are just dragging us and so you know I'm getting ready to get hurt and I look to my right Antoine's on the ground it's like what wait wait a minute what so Antoine's on the ground rolling ooh ooh I was like are you serious and so I had to finish the race and mind you I'm distracted because I had looked back at Antoine so now I'm really like in the back I get like next to last and so Antoine was hurt Mm -hmm. His mom came to pick him up. I still don't think he was really hurt. Antoine just didn't want to lose either. I was like, whatever, Antoine. But no, Antoine, his mama came and picked him up all the way from the track. I was so mad because <laughs> I had to get like, I, either it was like dead last or next to last. And if it was next to last, it was only because Antoine got last. I was so mad. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you be trying to do some trickery. Just, just be honest and take your L like, like, like a G because I probably could have gotten about fourth had I just stayed focused. But I was so mad. <laughs> Oh, that was funny. Like, Antoine used to get me in trouble, too. Like, because, man, Antoine, he had, like, the coolest mom because his mom was a lot more laid back than mine. Like, she was fun. I used to love going to her house because she, like, knew all the music we listened to and, you know, spoke all the same lingo and everything. And so a lot of times when I wanted to go and do something I should not be doing, which to my parents was, like, house parties and stuff, not even that bad, I would always just say, you know, I'm going to Antoine's house. And then, you know, we'd go to wherever. And, uh, but, man, I, I was so annoyed. I was like, dang it, Antoine, now nah, I got to lose. <laughs> but yeah so that was that overall I remember eighth grade being more enjoyable than seventh you know my friends group was a little bit more cemented I was starting to really just kind of figure out where I fit in with different groups of people and I just remember laughing a little bit more now I will say my grades weren't that great seventh and eighth grade weren't really good years for me academically like if you remember 
I was talking about being in sixth grade when I got back from Italy and like I had like straight A's for the first time. And so the thing about straight A's, once you get them, <laughs> your parents expect you to have them every single time. And so seventh grade, you know, was kind of lackluster. Eighth grade, I actually did even worse. And and I think eighth grade was when I got like my first D on a report card. Mr. Samucci's life science class. And that was already a mess. Cause mind you, like I'm already a science dork. Like I love science, I love history. And so I always had like an A in science, but that man, <laughs> he had me going through it in his class. I was stressed. Um, but anyway, I, the last thing I do remember, I remember <laughs> the end of the school year, you know, you start giving out the certificates and everything, the students and all. And so I had got the perfect attendance award. I was so happy about this little award I got, you know, perfect attendance. I had been there every single day, not even tardy for no classes. And man, I remember I got home <laughs> and I gave my parents that <laughs> attendance award. But mind you, you got the award with your report card. And so I got all these like C's and, and that D and like a few B's. I just remember coming home with my little certificate. I was so excited to give it to him and everything. Cause like I said, I hadn't really been having that great of a school year. So I'm like, at least I got something. And my dad was like, what is this? I was like, oh dad, it's my award for perfect attendance. He's like, oh, so you ain't got no honor award or no, no awards or nothing you have for track? No, Dad, this is the perfect attendance because I was there every day. I know you was there every day, but what's the point of going every day if you all you got are C's and D's? <laughs> so I was like, dang. Well, excuse me, because he's like, I remember there was a time you was in sixth grade, you was bringing all kind of awards. You was bringing awards for excellence in math, excellence in reading, excellence in this. And now you come here with an award for showing up. You're supposed to show up. Shoot, there's people that go to church every Sunday. That don't mean they're getting into heaven. My question is, what were you doing while you was there? Because again, you ain't got no A's. And you got one B on this report card. One B, but you want to be there every day all in the school just taking up space just fried me all up like my dad is so funny or was so funny because he 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 never had a lot of filter when he would tell you about yourself you had to just sit there and take it and so i mean i guess it worked ninth grade the following year i definitely was like on the honor roll again and had like a 4.0 the whole school year but yeah he used to just get you right together but anyway this podcast has ran for a little too long so yes that was eighth grade um interesting time great friends some funny little memories but yeah it, it, it was a moment but Again, we will catch up in the next episode. Until next time.